Welcome to Prevention Through Connection. I'm Kathy Samuels, Project Director for the Manhasset Community Coalition Against Substance Abuse, also known as CASA. Today's program continues our Generation RX Safe Medication Practices for Life series with a focus on one young adult's experience with the consequences of prescription drug and heroin addiction. With us is Stephen Dodge, a certified credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselor and founder and CEO of the Long Island-based Slate Project, saving lives from addiction through treatment and education. Stephen is a resident of Oceanside, New York, and speaks across Long Island to raise awareness among teens and young adults about the ongoing struggles of drug addiction, the path to recovery, and the importance of healthy living for today's adolescents. Welcome, Stephen, and thank you for joining us here on PATV. Thank you so much for having me. You know, today uh, the Surgeon General just came out with a report back in 2016 that one in seven people are expected to develop a substance abuse disorder at some point in their lives. Can you share with us as to when you began your path uh, to addiction? Um, it's like kind of hard to say per se. Like I, I truly believe I was born with addiction, right? I was born with uh, the addictive gene and it wasn't until I had my first drink um, that that really started to uncover and develop um, but I did have my f I tasted alcohol for my first time when I was about 10 years old um, not like I was at the bar drinking but I did have alcohol consumption I didn't get drunk but I got the sense of ease and comfort that came over my body that was a direct relation to drinking and what kind of a situation was it that you had your first drink um, it was, I was out to eat with my aunt and uncle, and my uncle was drinking what I remember being a big mug of beer, and I was very intrigued. I was watching him drink it, watching him drink it, and he saw that I was watching him drink it, and he asked me if I wanted a sip. To him, it seemed harmless. He's uneducated, right, on substance abuse, and I'm sure when he was growing up, that was kind of almost the norm. Um, and I said, yeah, and I drank it, and uh, I felt right away, like, the warmth come over my body. I felt, uh... I didn't have those thoughts going through my head, like, what do I say to get into this conversation, or I just felt very at ease. Yeah. I know, I know for a lot of people, parents often think that allowing their kids to sip alcohol at a young age, that that is actually, you know, something to do that might help alleviate, you know, the, the charm of alcohol later on. But we do know through many, many uh, research, uh, researchers are telling us that even small sips of alcohol at a young age can increase the likelihood of kids um, taking a path towards addiction. Uh, we know that uh, from OASAS, that one, uh, one in, I think it's seven times more likely uh, to um, have an addiction problem if you start drinking under the age of 15. Um, so for you, it started at a young age of, of 10. Um, did it how did it progress uh, to where you were uh, in, you know, in terms of the opioid epidemic? Yeah, yeah, it really didn't progress right away. I wasn't 10 years old getting blackout drunk all the time. However, as I got older, um, you know, I'd say around like middle school, I started to circulate my, myself around a lot of people that were, you know, experimenting with alcohol and marijuana, and I started to hang out in that crowd. And once I started doing that, it started becoming more and more of like a social norm. And the more I continued to do it, the more comfortable I felt doing it. So it started to progress in that way. Um, I didn't really get involved into you know, opioid medication until about high school, but uh, this is all predecessor to it, you know, it's like. Yeah, and, and I, I know one of the things you mentioned on your website, uh, this I think it's the slateproject.org, which mm -hmm. we'll be uh, showing throughout the program, is that for you it seemed as if everybody was drinking. Um, that you surround that it, or, or it was that you surrounded yourself around these people. So, w was the entire you know adolescent population in your high school drinking at the time? Uh, was of, that what was going on? Of course not. So I mean, it it I chose to associate myself with other individuals that were drinking as I was drinking because I didn't want to feel abnormal by doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I. The group of friends I decided to get involved with were the ones that were drinking as I was drinking. So it, 
to me, it seemed so normal. It seemed like everybody was doing it, but it's only because the people I chose to associate myself with, with were, were drinking. Yeah. How did you wind up uh, on that path toward uh, opioid addiction? You had mentioned it. You know, you don't become a heroin addict or an opioid addict overnight. Yeah, no, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, "I think I'm going to try heroin today." It's always a progression of addiction. So, with me personally, it started with an injury. I broke my hand when I was in ninth grade and uh, I got these pins in my hand and the doctor gave me a prescription called Vicodin. Wasn't really sure what Vicodin was. The doctor said if your hand hurts, take two of these and your hand won't hurt. So my hand hurt and I took two and uh, I had smoked marijuana after school and the combination of those two substances that brought me to a place I had never felt like I've never been before. Um, Essentially, I felt complete, right? I believe I was born with like this void inside me, right? And I was searched for outside things to, to make me happy, make me feel complete. And when I found the combination of these two substances, I had felt complete. So I wanted to feel complete from now on. Obviously, everybody wants to feel complete. I just happened to have found that sense of complete, completeness through these substances. Now, you know, you mentioned that this feeling of complete. Now, at the time, ninth grade, you, yeah. were, you were a good student. Yeah. You were a good student. You were an athlete. Yeah. And, and, and I think you were a high-performing athlete. Athlete. Tell, tell us about those experiences. Yeah, I mean, um, leading up until, you know, the end of high school, I was always very involved in, in school, um, more in the earlier years than mm -hmm. not. But as my addiction progressed, I lost interest in a lot of the external things that used to make me happy. So, um, you know, I stopped with any extracurricular activity. I uh, quit the wrestling team. Um, I really wanted nothing to do with anything unless it was hanging out with my friends and, mm -hmm. you know, essentially getting high getting or getting high. drunk. I mean, and during that process, I mean, you, your parents must have been uh, beside themselves uh, as to seeing what's happening in your life. Um, tell us a little bit about that, that uh, I guess, observation on their part of what you were going through at the time. Yeah, I mean, so this was all new to them, mm -hmm. right? My parents were divorced. Um, my dad also battles with addiction. So my dad was, uh, in early high school years, was kind of out of the picture. We didn't have much of a relationship because he was getting himself healthy and uh, whatever direction and path he was going down, you know, now he's very much in my life um, and sober. However, That's great. Yeah, yeah, That's it's great. great. We have a gr really good relationship. Um, however, at that point in time, it was really just my mom, right? And mm -hmm. uh, working f extra hours to make up for sure. only having one parent, right, mm -hmm. and doing everything she could in, in every aspect that she could, right? She did the best with what she had. Um, I was very good at manipulating, right? So, uh, you know, I quit the wrestling team. You know, I really, I, I said, like, I'm not gonna do this in college, so why am I gonna do it now? And I uh, kinda like was always able to find a rebuttal or an excuse on why I was acting the way I was acting. To cover up. Basically anything to protect my drinking and drugging. Drinking and drugging. Yeah. You combined both. Which, of course. Which, and we know that um, when people are addicted to alcohol or marijuana as well as cocaine, that they are just so much more likely to um, possibly become addicted to opioids and heroin. Um, but for you, Stephen, I'm, I'm, in terms of your access to prescription drugs, um, you started with a prescription to Vicodin, but I'm sure the doctor wasn't prescribing Vicodin to you, you know, every other week. Um, how did you gain access to prescription pills? Well, so this is, this is pre-iStop days. Okay. Um, so for anyone who's listening who's not familiar with iStop, right, it's a uh, computerized system, so all doctors and pharmacists are kind of in network with each other, right? So if I get a prescription, it's mm -hmm. now uploaded into the computer system, and I can't get another prescription for another 30 days of any narcotic, right? Correct. So this is pre that, right? So I was able to go to this doctor on this corner, tell him the story about my hand, get a prescription, wow. and then walk to this doctor on this corner, tell him about my hand and get a prescription, and then walk to this doctor on this corner, tell him about my hand and get a prescription. So I was over-prescribed unbeknownst to the doc, all right. the doctors because they're not in communication. Yeah. So, um, and that, that's the doctor shopping concept. That's, that's the doctor shopping concept, and, exactly. Right, right. And uh, so that, that was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so now the more my, predict, my addiction progressed, the more I needed to feel that desired euphoric effect that I was feeling, you know, because my tolerance would, would build up and up and I'd need to take more to get the high that I wanted. And uh, it kind of forced me into buying them on the street. So it went from what I saw as oh, doctor's orders, this is what the doctor said I could do, to now meeting somebody on the street to buy them illegally. 
were you, did you ever gain access to, um, in, in people's homes, to medications that, uh, you know, did you ever take from other people? Yeah. Because, you know, because we hear a lot of statistics about that, about kids, uh, who, you know, being addicted are that much more likely to gain access through, the, through other people's medicine cabinets. Exactly. So the, the, actually the very first time I tried uh, a pill was in somebody's medicine cabinet. Um, so it's very important for people to know what's in their medicine cabinet if it's not being utilized to discard of it in a safe way Because um, for me, I mean I was searching for it, you know what I mean? So it's not like if it wasn't there I wouldn't have tried it because I, I was out to find it However, I did come across it and that is how I tried my first pill. You tried it. Yeah. I mean So you, you tried your first pill you're, you're now searching for it. How did you wind up uh, going to heroin? So it's uh, my story. It's a very long progression. Um, I started with prescription Vicodin, and as I progressed, I had to take so many. Then that prescription Vicodin turned into oxycotton and oxycodone, um, and from there, my life really started to spiral out of control because the the intensity of the addiction was so much stronger. And a couple of years of progression of oxy prescription use um, just led me into the heroin use. Now, a lot of people don't understand heroin and prescription med prescription right. pills are the same Chem exact thing. Chemically, yeah. Right? yeah. One, one is sold at a pharmacy and one is sold on the street. That's really Correct. the only difference in the strength, you know, and right. someone told me heroin was cheaper, heroin was stronger, and heroin was more readily available. There was really no thought process. Right, right. I didn't battle with myself. Should I do this? Should I not? It was just, it seemed like the next step. Right. I mean, we know every day over a thousand people are treated in emergency rooms across our country. Oh, yeah. You know, and and you mentioned, you know, there was like the series of years. I mean, there must have been so many different despairing moments in your family. I mean, when did you realize that finally you needed help, or or did your parent, your mom, or your dad come and realize, you know, speak to you about it? Um, my family was definitely concerned before I was. Uh, I was in extreme denial, as were they, but mm -hmm. I was definitely in extreme denial with myself. Oh, I'm just going through a phase, I'm a kid, I'll stop when I want, I'm just not ready, this, this, and that. And then when I got to a point where I didn't want to use anymore, I already crossed that threshold and I was using against my own will because I wasn't able to just stop. Because by that point, your brain and your And I was completely was physically addicted, addicted to addicted. The medication. So, I, you know, in terms of parents who m might have a, a, young, a young adult or a teen in their home um, listening in, what, what can you say to them about what, where you've gone through, you know, in terms of your process of being addicted and recovery, but within the addiction itself, you know, what advice do you have for parents uh, dealing with a child or, or a, again, a young adult that might be going through this? Sure. Um, it's important to understand a lot, er, almost everybody, when you're going through this, you have a lot of different voices in your ear, right? People telling you how to handle it, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. There really isn't too much right or wrong because every situation is definitely individualized based on the individual that's suffering. Um, but I know f what, what, what definitely helped me was that my mom always had her hand out to help me, right? She never turned her back on me. She was always there. And um, one day I reached for that hand. You know, so if she had pulled it away at any point and I went to reach for it and wasn't right. there. But different knows? from enabling. D there's well, there's a very fine line between in, right, being a right. mother and enabling, right? right and don't right. get me wrong, my mom definitely right. enabled me at times, and we definitely had a codependent relationship. However, I always knew I can turn to her when I was ready for help. Right. No, she never that, closed the door on me. She you. never closed the door on me, and right. that, that was right. a big part because she was the person I called. Right. And and the other part I know you mentioned earlier was that you're in your family. Your dad had issues with addiction. Yes. Um, and and as a KSAC, I'm sure uh, you understand what what's at stake for people people who have addiction in the family. Could you explain to the audience that link and why that makes you so much more susceptible to addiction? Sure, so I'll, I'll disclose not just my dad, right? So my dad's dad died of addiction. Um, my dad's an addict in recovery. My dad has a lot of people on his side of the family that's either actively using. So, and before we get into that, and your dad is a successful business person? He is, yeah. Right. So yeah. It, it, typically many people believe that addicts have a certain, I guess, uh, look about them and, you know, people might think of the person on the Bowery, down on their luck, and that's not the case anymore. Of course. I mean, people that I randomly meet probably don't assume that kid used to shoot heroin and smoke crack cocaine, right? So it's right. not like 
I don't look like what people would perceive as the stereotypical addict or alcoholic. Even to me, I didn't. It was that's why it was hard for me to accept that I was an addict or alcoholic because I would look in the mirror and th that's this, not me. This that's not me. Yeah. You know, the alcoholic yeah. was the guy on the side of the road begging for his money for the next drink. Right. Today, I know that the only thing that qualifies me as an alcoholic is the effect alcohol has on my body once I start drinking. Right. And it's not about how much I drink or how often I drink. It's what happens to me when I drink. Right. So, so in terms of um, uh, kids who might be watching, you know, we, we talked about parents, but wh what would you like to say to teens after going through addiction and recovery in, in terms of them seeking help? How can you encourage them to seek help? Um, the, the one thing that was said to me that I always try to instill in others is there's no shame in asking for help. The only thing there's shame in is needing help and not asking for it. Right. right, so it's right. about utilizing the resources that are available for you. Um, and if you're like a friend of somebody who's using, you're not you know, a snitch or a rat by telling on them. You're somebody that's gonna be there to help them. Because someone that, a simple, compassionate conversation somebody had with me, change the course of my life forever in a positive way. Right. right. You know, and I think that's very interesting what you said that especially for high school students who might be watching one of their friends decline yeah. uh, as as you declined in, in high school and progressed through through drugs and alcohol, marijuana, um, it's not snitching. It's getting somebody the help they need. Exactly. Um, and, and we know 210 uh, people died of heroin and opioid uh, overdose here in Nassau County. Yep. Um, and you know we know naloxone is working. Uh, we've got many naloxone trainings happening through Nassau County, uh, as well as other private organizations, uh, excuse me, uh, nonprofit organizations that are doing training across the island uh, to uh, help bring naloxone uh, out to families who need it uh, to rescue their, See, their kids. I, I would rather somebody say, I hate you for telling on me, than me standing at their funeral saying I should have said something. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen, so much for sharing your struggles uh, with addiction. Uh, we're going to take a short break and hear from our uh, Generation Rx about the importance of using medication safely in the prevention of prescription drug misuse. When we come back, we'll talk with Stephen about his path to recovery. Prescription drug misuse is a public health crisis with drug overdose accounting for the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. We can avert this crisis by using medications safely. Let's consider what this means and why it's important. Let's first define a prescription medication. By law, certain medications require a prescription containing instructions that authorize that patient to receive the drug. Thus, Prescription medications are deemed to be safe and effective only when used under the supervision of a healthcare professional and only for the individual for whom the medication is prescribed. So how can we use medications safely? Let's consider four safe medication practices, which all of us can incorporate into our everyday lives. First and foremost, only take prescription medications as instructed by a healthcare professional. Remember, there's a reason that a prescription is required for some medications. Oversight by a healthcare professional helps keep us safe and reduces the risk of adverse drug events like drug dependency and addiction for some medications or dangerous interactions if we take our medications with other substances. Never take a medication with alcohol or other drugs without getting their advice first. Second, Never share your prescription drugs with others or take someone else's medications. A prescription for a medication is partly based on the unique characteristics of the person for whom it was prescribed. Everyone is different genetically and using someone else's medication can lead to significant harm. Sharing prescription medications is also illegal. Third, store prescription drugs in lockable spaces and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. Most people who misuse prescription drugs get them from family members or friends. So, when finished with a prescription medication, follow the prescription's instructions for safe disposal or place the medication in a drug drop box in your community. And finally, model safe medication practices for others. What your family and friends see you doing with prescription drugs matters. 
Prescription medications can help us live longer and healthier lives, but only when used as directed by a healthcare professional. The misuse of any prescription drug is unsafe and can lead to detrimental, even fatal outcomes. We each can do our part to prevent prescription drug misuse by following these safe medication practices. Visit GenerationRx.org to learn more. This message is brought to you by the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy and the Cardinal Health Foundation. Welcome back to the second half of our program with Stephen Dodge, founder and CEO of The Slate Project. I would like to turn our focus to your recovery and how our communities can help uh, prevent addiction and encourage recovery. Um, you mentioned in your mission for The Slate Project that people who suffer for addiction need real help. Um, what do you consider to be re real help? And tell us a little bit about how The Slate Project uh, can help our communities. Sure, um, I think real help, it's definitely a broad statement, right? So so I believe this has to come from all angles in a community. I, I feel like too many times people see, like metaphorically, right, like this is their street, there's, there's this, these houses on the street instead of where one street, right? So nobody's mm -hmm. really watching out for each other type of thing. It's, it's not my kid, it's not in my backyard, right. you know what I mean? So nobody's really looking out for each other. So when I say real help, it's, you know, police, school, parents, neighbors, community as a whole. Because that's what communities are for. Communities right, are there right. to, to help each other. Right, I mean here in Manhasset we have a community coalition. Of uh, we are the, uh, part of the Drug Free Community Support Program. And uh, what we're seeing right now is so many communities uh, down in Rockville Center, mm -hmm. uh, out all the way to Riverhead, uh, a lot of drug free community coalitions are coming together. And they encompass many, many different uh, you know sectors. Of course. Uh, from parents to schools, to law enforcement, to clergy. We're um, actually in the process of forming one in Oceanside now. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. You yeah. Please ha tell them, feel free to give us a ring. I uh, will. We would love to uh, talk with you uh, further about that. But um, how did the Slate Project come about uh, when, you know, obviously you were in recovery. Sure, and, yeah. Uh, um, it was right around my, f my first year mark mm -hmm. um, in recovery. So when I almost had one year sober, I. I don't know what it was. It's something just came over me. Said, you know, you should talk to the kids, right? So I walked in. I literally just walked into my old high school, and I said, uh, I want to talk to the kids. Can I talk to them? Maybe about what you went through. What I went through. Just talk right, to them about my right. experience, because um, I know the the benefit and impact that has, mm -hmm. right? Especially as a young adult, they almost see themselves in me. So they said, we could do you one better. We have this thing called Human Relations Day, where it's a day of just speakers, and we'll sign we'll sign you up for that. You could. You could do that, and uh, all the teach all my teachers that I had when I was in high school saw my name and signed up, and it was a huge audience. I spoke maybe seven periods in a row mm -hmm. to uh, like a hundred or so kids at a time, and uh, it was a huge success from the kids' standpoint, from the faculty standpoint. From there, they referred me somewhere else to speak, and then that person referred me somewhere else, and I was getting all these speaking commitments, and. Uh, I said I, I should probably I could do something bigger, you know. So I decided to incorporate, apply for my nonprofit status, and uh, you know just really started going out and and speaking to whatever facet would take me. Right. Um, right. So you know I wanted to just take a, a step uh, back to what we are defining as recovery. So we know what addiction is, that's when your life is consumed by the, uh, the drug, whether it's alcohol, marijuana, prescription pills, um, leads to series of consequences that manipulate your life. Then you sought treatment. Mm -hmm. So tr tell us just a little bit about the treatment that you went through, and then that, pa like, define recovery for sure. our audience. Sure, so I went to a detox, which is a hospitalized setting where I'm given um, certain medications so I don't feel the, the physical withdrawals, um, which is the least of my worries, right, mm -hmm. the physical, because then I have the whole mental component to battle with. And then I went to a 28-day inpatient program where I gained self-knowledge, knowledge on addiction, knowledge on me, and... Uh, and yourself. And Yeah, knowledge on myself. I gained some tools to, to utilize in real-life situations, things like that, and... Uh, Tell us about those tools. So, I mean, it's, it's all... It's definitely individualized mm -hmm. for per person and um, you know per situation. Uh, I really the the main thing I got from 
rehab was the knowledge, the tools I learned really, um, or how to apply them was when I came home and I practiced a 12-step program. Okay. See, that's, that's what really helped me maintain long-term Recover. sobriety, recovery. Sobriety. Okay. Um, so for me, recovery isn't just the absence of drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. right? That's called abstinence, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a huge difference between recovery and being abstinent. So recovery is a lifestyle. It's a way of life. It's okay. a positive lifestyle. Um, my goal of each day is how can I impact somebody else's life, right? Because addiction is a very self-centered disease. Self-centered, self-seeking, and selfish. That's my core issues. Um, so when I'm when I'm in, stuck in self, I do something selfless for somebody else and I get out of myself, right? Because that's what drugs are really, why I utilized drugs was to get out of myself because I wasn't comfortable with me. So essentially drugs and alcohol are the solution to the problem. I'm the problem. So when they took that solution away, I was left with just the problem and I felt even worse than I did when I was using because I didn't have that solution in my life. Right. So now what recovery is, is about changing me. So what can I do to change the way I act, think, feel, and, and even speak, right? So I had to change everything about myself so I was comfortable with me and I didn't seek that old solution anymore. Right. Yeah. So what, what is it you want the people to understand about the Slate Project? So you're going out to schools. Uh, is there any other components of Slate that, uh, that you would like our audience to know about? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the main goal is education, prevention, awareness, generally with the youth population of the communities. However, we do also speak to parents or PTA or whatever, really whatever um, population mm -hmm. we can speak in front of, we speak in front of. Uh, I do feel like it's been most impactful because, you know, I'm 27, but I look like I just graduated high school, <laughs> right? So it's like these kids could see themselves in right. me. I right. dress the part. I wear Jordans when I go in there. You know what I mean? So, like, there's definitely a method to my madness. Um, I do project a positive message in the correct way. I try to stay in the feelings and emotions of the age group I'm speaking in front of. Mm -hmm. um, but then also... Um, we raise money for addicts in need, right? So mm -hmm. if somebody's, so we're dealing with the people for early intervention, uh, trying to plant that seed before they go into a, like addiction, and then mm -hmm. we also are trying to help those that are currently are already in it. In it who right? are in it? Sure, sure. You know, the whole uh, uh, project that you're working on really is exposing yourself to, yeah. your, you know, your family, your story. I mean, how difficult was that to kind of be an open book on the things that you did? Yeah, I mean, um, I didn't really see it see it like that at first, right? I kind of was just, I had this huge passion almost like burning in me, right? Like I have, like I felt like I have to do this, like mm -hmm. it was my calling, right? Like I feel like I was handpicked from addiction and placed here for a specific reason and I ran with it. I guess I didn't really think on, you know, how is this affecting mom and my brother and all these other right. people that now I'm exposed and you go to the grocery how, how store. How are they dealing with it? Um, my mom couldn't be happier. Listen, right. I can be right. shooting heroin and in a mm -hmm. casket or I can be doing something right. positive in my right. community, right? And my mom speaks with me to parents and she goes around and she does it with me and, and uh, Listen, I have the best relationship with, with my family. Yeah. You know, I mentioned earlier the 2015, 210 people died of yeah. uh, opioid overdose. I'm, I'm curious, how many friends have you lost uh, to the opioid epidemic? Um, I don't want to say like personal friends, but I've been to probably 20 funerals in the past almost oh, that, four oh years. Oh my God, that's crazy. 20 young people yeah. in a casket, young zero people. chance of recovery, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, a, it's a message, it really is, unfortunately. Uh, you know, it, it's part of what we hope uh, with this program is to, you know, kind of share not not only the fact that, you know, prescription drug addiction can happen to anyone, but recovery yeah. is possible. Recovery is real, recovery is possible, and that's the, that's my main message. So also I, I do put the message of addiction, what addiction is, but my main goal is to portray a message that recovery is real and recovery is possible, and I think that's the most important piece. I mean, Oceanside just lost three kids in two days oh, last week. I'm so sorry to you hear You know, that. so it's oh. like, this is real. This is happening. Yeah. And unfortunately, it takes a death toll for people to stand up and say, we should we should have did something. And, yeah. you know, you, you probably know just as well as I do when we host community forums or community meetings, attendance isn't where it should be. 
and it's an yeah. unfortunate thing. I mean, and that's why we do these kinds of programs at PATV with the hope that the message is going to get out yet at, through another medium and um, because parents don't, can't, some parents can't come out. Of course. No, um, don't get me you, wrong. You, no, no, I, I, I'm with yeah. you I, because we run the, the same programs and, you know, we, we're constantly trying to come up with ways to reach people with the core message um, and it, it's so important uh, for, for people like yourself who are doing such positive things in the community uh, to come talk on PATV, share your information, um, and, and also, you know, share the struggles you've had. Exactly. Um, and and if, if I can just impact one person's life, in the, just one in the audience, right, then I know that I did, that I did a well job. Right. And, uh, like, that's why I like the school setting, because it's a captive audience, right? If it's an after-school program, or I've done it at colleges before where they don't have to be there, the attendance isn't where it should be, right? So now if I'm in an in-school assembly, this is a captive audience, and people that need to hear the message are going to be there. Right. Yeah. You know, before we uh, close the program today, I just was curious if you had any other pearls of wisdom uh, from your recovery, things you've experienced, to, again, directed towards parents, directed towards teens. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, for, for parents, um, I would definitely say you're a parent first, friend second, right? Mm. I like that one because a lot of parents are like, Oh, you can ha you can drink here. You know, as long as you're drinking here, they're in a, a right, safe setting. Right. They're going to be drinking anyway. I'd rather them have it here. Like, be the parent that is so up your butt, right? That it's almost embarrassing and annoying, right? My my mom will call my friend's mom to make sure that I'm actually going there, right? My mom is, became friends with my friend's moms to have that inner to working have the circle, circle, right? Yeah. Because I can say I'm going to Tommy's house. And Tommy's parents aren't home, and we're drinking at Tommy's house, right? So my mom now knows Tommy's right. mother, so right. it can make that connection. You know, and we know here in Nassau County, we have a social host law. Uh -huh. um, we have a general obligations law, which uh, in the event that uh, kids are drinking and cause injury or harm uh, yeah. by person or property, their parents are liable. Uh, we have a good Samaritan law, which, mm -hmm. which we know uh, has been uh, in, in working with the uh, heroin epidemic, but it also applies to alcohol. Of and, course. And, uh, uh, alcohol um, overdose but um, you know for for t for kids you know what, what are some of the last thoughts you would like to share with kids uh, before we leave today I would just like to really just drive home um, just be aware of your surroundings stay stay aware of what you're around and what you're going through because there's been a lot of times where I'm like I'm not comfortable with where I'm at right now but I'm so scared of rejection and I have a fear of acceptance that I'm going to stay here That's anyway. what you felt in, in high school? Yeah, for sure, right? Sure. Even though I had so many friends, right? But I always had that fear, fear that I wasn't good enough or I had to prove myself to this group of people, even though they loved me for who I was, right? So it's important to... In, in hindsight, um, were there people you could have talked to? that you maybe didn't realize? Yeah, of course. I mean, there was people that I did talk to that I just wasn't truthful with, right? So it's, oh. it's definitely utilize the resources that are available for you and understand recovery is a real thing. And mm -hmm. I belong to a group, a recovery group, right, that it's all young people in recovery doing the right thing. And I, my biggest fear was how do I have fun with people my age that are doing the same thing as me, right? right? So right. I, I, I found that early on and I'm very blessed to have found that but That's just know great. that it's there. You know? And there's a new recovery center out in Hop Hog. Uh, I, I think it's called so. Thrive yeah. uh, through New York State. I think LICAD is affiliated with it. Um, we'll have that information up on, on the, tele on the uh, screen uh, as we close. But um, Stephen, I, I thank you for uh, coming to, to see us today and sharing your information. And uh, we wish you the best in all you do. And yeah, look thank forward. You so much. We look forward to seeing you out talking with kids uh, as well as adults. Me uh, as well. T thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. We hope today's program has been informative about the consequences of prescription drug misuse, as well as the importance of safe medicine practices. Manhasset Casa encourages all residents to dispose of unwanted medications at local pharmaceutical take-back events, as well as at any Nassau County Police Department precinct, as many teens and adults who abuse prescription drugs access them through friends and family. For additional resources about prescription drug misuse prevention, go to manhasacasa.org or generationrx.org. Until next time, this is Kathy Samuels from Manhasacasa wishing you and your family a healthy and safe tomorrow. Thank you.